Chapter nine of Elective Affinities and this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter nine. The birthday was come, and everything was ready. The wall was all complete, which protected the raised village road against the water, and so was the walk. Passing the church, for a short time it followed the path which had been laid out by Charlotte, and then winding upwards among the rocks, inclined first under the summer-house to the right, and then, after a wide sweep, passed back above it to the right again, and so by degrees out on to the summit. A large party had assembled for the occasion. They went first to church, where they found the whole congregation collected together in their holiday dresses. After service they filed out in order, first the boys, then the young men, then the old. After them came the party from the castle with their visitors and retinue, and the village maidens, young girls and women, brought up the rear. At the turn of the walk a raised stone seat had been contrived, where the captain made Charlotte and the visitors stop and rest. From here they could see over the whole distance from the beginning to the end, the troops of men who had gone up before them, the file of women following, and now drawing up to where they were. It was lovely weather, and the whole effect was singularly beautiful. Charlotte was taken by surprise, she was touched, and she pressed the captain's hand warmly. They followed the crowd who had slowly ascended, and were now forming a circle round the spot where the future house was to stand. The lord of the castle, his family, and the principal strangers were now invited to descend into the vault, where the fountain stone, supported on one side, lay ready to be let down. A well-dressed mason, a trowel in one hand, and a hammer in the other, came forward, and with much grace spoke an address in verse, of which in prose we can give but an imperfect rendering. Three things he began are to be looked to in a building, that it stand on the right spot, that it be securely founded, and that it be successfully executed. The first is the business of the master of the house, his and his only. As in the city the prince and the council alone determined where a building shall be, so in the country it is the right of the lord of the soil that he shall say, Here my dwelling shall stand, here and nowhere else. Edward and Ottilie were standing opposite one another as these words were spoken, but they did not venture to look up and exchange glances. To the third, the execution, there is neither art nor handicraft which must not in some way contribute. But the second, the founding, is the province of the mason, and, boldly to speak it out, it is the head and front of all the undertaking. A solemn thing it is, and our bidding you descend hither is full of meaning. You are celebrating your festival in the deep of the earth. Here within this hollow spot you show us the honour of appearing as witnesses of our mysterious craft. Presently we shall lower down this carefully hewn stone into its place, and soon these earth walls, now ornamented with fair and worthy persons, will be no more accessible, but will be closed in for ever. This foundation stone, which with its angles typifies the just angles of the building, with the sharpness of its moulding, the regularity of it, and with the truth of its lines to the horizontal and perpendicular, the uprightness and equal height of all the walls, we might now without more ado let down. It would rest in its place with its own weight. But even here there shall not fail of lime and means to bind it. For as human beings who may be well inclined to each other by nature, yet hold more firmly together when the law cements them, so are stones also, whose forms may already fit together, united far better by these binding forces. It is not seemly to be idle among the working, and here you will not refuse to be our fellow labourer. With these words he reached the trial to Charlotte, who threw mortar with it under the stone. Several of the others were then desired to do the same, and then it was at once let fall, upon which the hammer was placed next in Charlotte's, and then in the other's hands, to strike six times with it, and conclude in this expression the wedlock of the stone with the earth. The work of the mason, went on the speaker, now under the free sky as we are, if it be not done in concealment, yet must pass into concealment. The soil will be laid smoothly in, and thrown over the stone, and with the walls which we rear into the daylight, we in the end are seldom remembered. The works of the stone-cutter and the carver remain under the eyes, but for us it is not to complain. When the plasterer blots out the last trace of our hands, and appropriates our work to himself, when he overlays it, and smooths it, and colours it. Not from regard for the opinion of others, but from respect for himself, the mason will be faithful in his calling. There is none who has more need to feel in himself the consciousness of what he is. When the house is finished, when the soil is smoothed, and the surface plastered over, and the outside all overwrought with ornament, he can even see in yet through all disguises, 
and still recognise those exact and careful adjustments to which the whole is indebted for its being and for its persistence but as the man who commits some evil deed has to fear that notwithstanding all precautions it will one day come to light so too must he expect who has done some good thing in secret that it also in spite of himself will appear in the day and therefore we make this foundation stone at the same time a stone of memorial here in these various hollows which have been hewn into it many things are now to be buried as a witness to some far-off world these metal cases hermetically sealed contain documents in writing matters of various note are engraved on these plates in these fair glass bottles we bury the best old wine with a note of the year of its vintage we have coins too of many kinds from the mint of the current year all this we have received through the liberality of him for whom we build there is space yet remaining if guest or spectator desires to offer anything to the afterworld after a slight pause the speaker looked round but as is commonly the case on such occasions no one was prepared they were all taken by surprise at last a merry-looking young officer set the example and said if i am to contribute anything which as yet is not to be found in this treasure chamber it shall be a pair of buttons from my uniform i don't see why they do not deserve to go down to posterity no sooner said than done and then a number of persons found something of the same sort which they could do the young ladies did not hesitate to throw in some of their side hair combs smelling bottles and other trinkets were not spared only ottilie hung back till a kind word from edward roused her from the abstraction in which she was watching the various things being heaped in then she unclasped from her neck the gold chain on which her father's picture had hung and with a light gentle hand laid it down on the other jewels edward rather disarranged the proceedings by at once in some haste having the cover let fall and fastened down the young mason who had been most active through all this again took his place as orator and went on we lay down this stone for ever for the establishing the present and the future possessors of this house but in that we bury this treasure together with it we do it in the remembrance in this most enduring of works of the perishableness of all human things we remember that a time may come when this cover so far sealed shall again be lifted and that can only be when all shall again be destroyed which as yet we have not brought into being but now now that it had once may begin to be back with our thoughts out of the future back into the present at once after the feast which we have this day kept together let us on with our labour let no one of all those trades which are to work on our foundation through us keep unwilling holiday let the building rise swiftly to its height and out of the windows which as yet have no existence may the master of the house with his family and with his guests look forth with a glad heart over his broad lands to him and to all here present herewith be health and happiness with these words he drained a richly cut tumbler at a draught and flung it into the air thereby to signify the excess of pleasure by destroying the vessel which had served for such a solemn occasion this time however it fell out otherwise the glass did not fall back to the earth and indeed without a miracle in order to get forward with the buildings they had already thrown out the whole of the soil at the opposite corner indeed they had begun to raise the wall and for this purpose had reared a scaffold as high as was absolutely necessary on the occasion of the festival boards had been laid along the top of this and a number of spectators were allowed to stand there it had been meant principally for the advantage of the workmen themselves the glass had flown up there and had been caught by one of them who took it as a sign of good luck for himself he waved it round without letting it out of his hand and the letters e and o were to be seen very richly cut upon it running one into the other it was one of the glasses which had been executed for edward when he was a boy the scaffoldings were again deserted and the most active among the party climbed up to look round them and could not speak enough in praise of the beauty of the prospect on all sides how many new discoveries does not a person make when on some high point he ascends but a single story higher inland many fresh villages came in sight the line of the river could be traced like a thread of silver indeed one of the party thought that he distinguished the spires of the capital on the other side behind the wooded hill the blue peaks of the far-off mountains were seen rising and the country immediately about them was spread out like a map if the three ponds cried some one were but thrown together to make a single sheet of water there would be everything here which is noblest and most excellent that might easily be effected the captain said in early times they must have formed all one lake among the hills here only i must beseech you to spare my clump of planes and poplars that stand so prettily by the centre pond said edward see he turned to ottilie bringing her a few steps forward and pointing down those trees i planted myself 
how long have they been standing there asked waterlee just about as long as you have been in the world replied edward yes my dear child i planted them when you were still lying in your cradle the party now betook themselves back to the castle after dinner was over they were invited to walk through the village to take a glance at what had been done there as well at a hint from the captain the inhabitants had collected in front of the houses they were not standing in rows but formed in natural family groups partly occupied at their evening work part out enjoying themselves on the new benches they had determined as an agreeable duty which they imposed upon themselves to have everything in its present order and cleanliness at least every sunday and holiday a little party held together by such feelings as had grown up among our friends is always unpleasantly interrupted by a large concourse of people all four were delighted to find themselves again alone in the large drawing-room but this sense of home was a little disturbed by a letter which was brought to edward giving notice of fresh guests who were to arrive the following day it is as we suppose edward cried to charlotte the count will not stay away he is coming to-morrow then the baroness too is not far off answered charlotte doubtless not said edward she is coming too to-morrow from another place they only beg to be allowed to stay for a night the next day they will go on together we must prepare for them in time ottilie said charlotte what arrangement shall i desire to be made ottilie asked charlotte gave a general direction and ottilie left the room the captain inquired into the relation in which these two persons stood towards one another and with which he was only very generally acquainted they had some time before both being already married fallen violently in love with one another a double marriage was not to be interfered with without attracting attention a divorce was proposed on the baroness's side it could be effected on that of the count it could not they were obliged seemingly to separate but their position towards one another remained unchanged and though in the winter at the residence they were unable to be together they indemnified themselves in the summer while making tours and staying at watering-places they were both slightly older than edward and charlotte and had been intimate with them from early times at court the connection had never been absolutely broken off although it was impossible to approve of their proceedings on the present occasion their coming was most unwelcome to charlotte and if she had looked closely into her reasons for feeling it so she would have found it was on account of ottilie the poor innocent girl should not have been brought so early in contact with such an example it would have been more convenient if they had not come till a couple of days later edward was saying as ottilie re-entered till we had finished with this business of the farm the deed of sale is complete one copy of it i have here but we want a second and our old clerk has fallen ill the captain offered his services and so did charlotte but there was something or other to object to both of them give it to me cried ottilie a little hastily you will never be able to finish it said charlotte and really i must have it early the day after to-morrow and it is long edward added it shall be ready ottilie cried and the paper was already in her hands the next morning as they were looking out from their highest windows for their visitors whom they intended to go some way and meet edward said who is that yonder riding slowly along the road the captain described accurately the figure of the horseman then it is he said edward the particulars which you can see better than i agree very well with the general figure which i can see too it is mittler but what is he doing coming riding at such a pace as that the figure came nearer and mittler it veritably was they received him with warm greetings as he came slowly up the steps why did you not come yesterday edward cried as he approached i do not like your grand festivities answered he but i am come to-day to keep my friend's birthday with you quietly are you able to find time enough asked edward with a laugh my visit if you can value it you owe to an observation which i made yesterday i was spending a right happy afternoon in a house where i had established peace and then i heard that a birthday was being kept here now this is what i call selfish after all said i to myself you will only enjoy yourself with those whose broken peace you have mended why cannot you for once go and be happy with friends who keep the peace for themselves no sooner said than done here i am as i determined with myself that i would be yesterday you would have met a large party here to-day you will find but a small one said charlotte you will meet the count and the baroness with whom you have had enough to do already i believe out of the middle of the party who had all four come down to welcome him the strange man dashed in the keenest disgust seizing at the same time his hat and whip some unlucky star is always over me he cried directly i try to rest and enjoy myself what business have i going out of my proper character i ought never to have come and now i am persecuted away under one roof with those two i will not remain and you take care of yourselves they bring nothing but mischief 
their nature is like leaven and propagates its own contagion they tried to pacify him but it was in vain whoever strikes at marriage he cried whoever either by word or act undermines this the foundation of all moral society that man has to settle with me and if i cannot become his master i take care to settle myself out of his way marriage is the beginning and the end of all culture it makes the savage mild and the most cultivated has no better opportunity for displaying his gentleness indissoluble it must be because it brings so much happiness that what small exceptional unhappiness it may bring counts for nothing in the balance and what do men mean by talking of unhappiness impatience it is which from time to time comes over them and then they fancy themselves unhappy let them wait till the moment is gone by and then they will bless their good fortune that what has stood so long continues standing there never can be any adequate ground for separation the condition of man is pitched so high in its joys and in its sorrows that the sum which two married people owe to one another defies calculation it is an infinite debt which can only be discharged through all eternity its annoyances marriage may often have i can well believe that and it is as it should be we are all married to our consciences and there are times when we should be glad to be divorced from them mine gives me more annoyance than ever a man or woman can give all this he poured out with the greatest vehemence he would very likely have gone on speaking longer had not the sound of the postilion's horns given notice of the arrival of the visitors who as if on a concerted arrangement drove into the castle court from opposite sides at the same moment mittler slipped away as their host hastened to receive them and desiring that his horse might be brought out immediately rode angrily off End of chapter nine Chapter ten of Elective Affinities This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Chapter ten. The visitors were welcomed and brought in. They were delighted to find themselves again in the same house and in the same rooms where in early times they had passed many happy days but which they had not seen for a long time their friends too were very glad to see them the count and the baroness had both those tall fine figures which please in middle life almost better than in youth if something of the first bloom had faded off them yet there was an air in their appearance which was always irresistibly attractive their manners too were thoroughly charming their free way of taking hold of life and dealing with it their happy humour and apparently easy unembarrassment communicated itself at once to the rest and a lighter atmosphere hung about the whole party without their having observed it stealing on them the effect made itself felt immediately on the entrance of the newcomers they were fresh from the fashionable world as was to be seen at once in their dress in their equipment and in everything about them and they formed a contrast not a little striking with our friends their country style and the vehement feelings which were at work underneath among them this however very soon disappeared in the stream of past recollection and present interests and a rapid lively conversation soon united them all after a short time they again separated the ladies withdrew to their own apartments and there found amusement enough in the many things which they had to tell each other and in setting to work at the same time to examine the new fashions the spring dresses bonnets and such like while the gentlemen were employing themselves looking at the new travelling chariots trotting out the horses and beginning at once to bargain and exchange they did not meet again till dinner in the meantime they had changed their dress and here too the newly arrived pairs showed to all advantage everything they wore was new and in a style which their friends at the castle had never seen and yet being accustomed to it themselves it appeared perfectly natural and graceful the conversation was brilliant and well sustained as indeed in the company of such persons everything and nothing appears to interest they spoke in french that the attendants might not understand what they said and swept in happiest humour over all that was passing in the great or the middle world on one particular subject they remained however longer than was desirable it was occasioned by charlotte asking after one of her early friends of whom she had to learn with some distress that she was on the point of being separated from her husband it is a melancholy thing charlotte said when we fancy our absent friends are finally settled when we believe persons very dear to us to be provided for for life suddenly to hear that their fortunes are cast loose once more that they have to strike into a fresh path of life and very likely a most insecure one indeed my dear friend the count answered it is our own fault 
if we allow ourselves to be surprised at such things we please ourselves with imagining matters of this earth and particularly matrimonial connections as very enduring and as concerns this last point the plays which we see over and over again help to mislead us being as they are so untrue to the course of the world in a comedy we see a marriage as the last aim of a desire which is hindered and crossed through a number of acts and at the instant when it is reached the curtain falls and the momentary satisfaction continues to ring on in our ears but in the world it is very different the play goes on still behind the scenes and when the curtain rises again we may see and hear perhaps little enough of the marriage it cannot be so very bad however said charlotte smiling we see people who have gone off the boards of the theatre ready enough to undertake a part upon them again there is nothing to say against that said the count in a new character a man may readily venture on a second trial and when we know the world we see clearly that it is only this positive eternal duration of marriage in a world where everything is in motion which has anything unbecoming about it a certain friend of mine whose humour displays itself principally in suggestions for new laws maintained that every marriage should be concluded only for five years five he said was a sacred number pretty and uneven such a period would be long enough for people to learn one another's character bring a child or two into the world quarrel separate and what was best get reconciled again he would often exclaim how happily the first part of the time would pass away two or three years at least would be perfect bliss on one side or other there would not fail to be a wish to have the relation continue longer and their amiability would increase the nearer they got to the parting time the indifferent even the dissatisfied party would be softened and gained over by such behaviour they would forget as in pleasant company the hours pass always unobserved how the time went by and they would be delightfully surprised when after the term had run out they first observed that they had unknowingly prolonged it charming and pleasant as all this sounded and deep charlotte felt it to her soul as was the moral significance which lay below it expressions of this kind on ottilie's account were most distasteful to her she knew very well that nothing was more dangerous than the licentious conversation which treats culpable or semi-culpable actions as if they were common ordinary and even laudable and of such undesirable kind assuredly were all which touched on the sacredness of marriage she endeavoured therefore in her skilful way to give the conversation another turn and when she found that she could not it vexed her that ottilie had managed everything so well that there was no occasion for her to leave the table in her quiet observant way a nod or look was enough for her to signify to the head servant whatever was to be done and everything went off perfectly although there were a couple of strange men in livery in the way who were rather a trouble than a convenience and so the count without feeling charlotte's hints went on giving his opinions on the same subject generally he was little enough apt to be tedious in conversation but this was a thing which weighed so heavily on his heart and the difficulties which he found in getting separated from his wife were so great that it had made him bitter against everything which concerned the marriage bond that very bond which notwithstanding he was so anxiously desiring between himself and the baroness the same friend he went on has another law which he proposes a marriage shall only be held indissoluble when either both parties or at least one or the other enter into it for the third time such persons must be supposed to acknowledge beyond a doubt that they find marriage indispensable for themselves they have had opportunities of thoroughly knowing themselves of knowing how they conducted themselves in their earlier unions whether they have any peculiarities of temper which are a more frequent cause of separation than bad dispositions people would then observe one another more closely they would pay as much attention to the married as the unmarried no one being able to tell how things may turn out that would add no little to the interest of society said edward as things are now when a man is married nobody cares any more either for his virtues or for his vices under this arrangement the baroness struck in laughing our good hosts have passed successfully over their two steps and may make themselves ready for their third things have gone happily with them said the count in their case death has done with a good will what in others the consistorial courts do with a very bad one let the dead rest said charlotte with a half serious look why so persevered the count when we can remember them with honour they were generous enough to content themselves with less than their number of years for the sake of the larger good which they could leave behind them alas that in such cases said the baroness with a suppressed sigh happiness is only bought with the sacrifice of our fairest years indeed yes answered the count and it might drive us to despair if it were not the same with everything in this world nothing goes as we hope children do not fulfil what they promise young people very seldom and if they keep their word the world does not keep its word with them 
charlotte who was delighted that the conversation had taken a turn at last replied cheerfully well then we must content ourselves with enjoying what good we are to have in fragments and pieces as we can get it and the sooner we can accustom ourselves to this the better certainly the count answered you too have had the enjoyment of very happy times when i look back upon the years when you and edward were the loveliest couple at the court i see nothing now to be compared with those brilliant times and such magnificent figures when you two used to dance together all eyes were turned upon you fastened upon you while you saw nothing but each other so much has changed since those days said charlotte that we can listen to such pretty things about ourselves without our modesty being shocked at them i often privately found fault with edward said the count for not being more firm those singular parents of his would certainly have given way at last and ten fair years is no trifle to gain i must take edward's part struck in the baroness charlotte was not altogether without fault not altogether free from what we must call prudential considerations and although she had a real hearty love for edward and did in her secret soul intend to marry him i can bear witness how sorely she often tried him and it was through this that he was at last unluckily prevailed upon to leave her and go abroad and try to forget her edward bowed to the baroness and seemed grateful for her advocacy and then i must add this she continued in excuse for charlotte the man who was at that time suing for her had for a long time given proofs of his constant attachment to her and when one came to know him well was a far more lovable person than the rest of you may like to acknowledge my dear friend the count replied a little pointedly confess now that he was not altogether indifferent to yourself and that charlotte had more to fear from you than from any other rival i find it one of the highest traits in women that they continue so long in their regard for a man and that absence of no duration will serve to disturb or remove it this fine feature men possess perhaps even more answered the baroness at any rate i have observed with you my dear count that no one has more influence over you than a lady to whom you were once attached i have seen you take more trouble to do things when a certain person has asked you than the friend of this moment would have obtained of you if she had tried such a change as that one must bear the best way one can replied the count but as to what concerns charlotte's first husband i could not endure him because he parted so sweet a pair from one another a really predestined pair who once brought together have no reason to fear the five years or be thinking of a second or third marriage we must try charlotte said to make up for what we then allowed to slip from us ay and you must keep to that said the count your first marriages he continued with some vehemence were exactly marriages of the true detestable sort and unhappily marriages generally even the best have forgive me for using a strong expression something awkward about them they destroy the delicacy of the relation everything is made to rest on the broad certainty out of which one side or other at least is too apt to make their own advantage it is all a matter of course and they seem only to have got themselves tied together that one or the other or both may go their own way the more easily at this moment charlotte who was determined once for all that she would put an end to the conversation made a bold effort at turning it and succeeded it then became more general she and her husband and the captain were able to take a part in it even ottilie had to give her opinion and the dessert was enjoyed in the happiest humour it was particularly beautiful being composed almost entirely of the rich summer fruits in elegant baskets with a pen of lovely flowers arranged in exquisite taste the new laying out of the park came to be spoken of and immediately after dinner they went to look at what was going on ottilie withdrew under pretence of having household matters to look to in reality it was to set to work again at the transcribing the count fell into conversation with the captain and charlotte afterwards joined them when they were at the summit of the height the captain good-naturedly ran back to fetch the plan and in his absence the count said to charlotte he is an exceedingly pleasing person he is very well informed and his knowledge is always ready his practical power too seems methodical and vigorous what he is doing here would be of great importance in some higher sphere charlotte listened to the captain's praises with an inward delight she collected herself however and composedly and clearly confirmed what the count had said but she was not a little startled when he continued this acquaintance falls most opportunely for me i know of a situation for which he is perfectly suited and i shall be doing the greatest favour to a friend of mine a man of high rank by recommending to him a person who is so exactly everything which he desires charlotte felt as if a thunderstroke had fallen on her the count did not observe it women being accustomed at all times to hold themselves in restraint are always able even in the most extraordinary cases to maintain an apparent composure but she heard not a word more of what the count said though he went on speaking when i have made up my mind upon a thing he added i am quick about it 
I have put my letter together already in my head, and I shall write it immediately. You can find me some messenger who can ride off with it this evening. Charlotte was suffering agonies. Startled with the proposal and shocked at herself, she was unable to utter a word. Happily, the Count continued talking of his plans for the captain, the desirableness of which was only too apparent to Charlotte. It was time that the captain returned. He came up and unrolled his design before the Count. But with what changed eyes Charlotte now looked at the friend whom she was to lose. In her necessity, she bowed and turned away, and hurried down to the summer-house. Before she was halfway there, the tears were streaming from her eyes, and she flung herself into the narrow room in the little hermitage, and gave herself up to an agony, a passion, a despair, of the possibility of which, but a few moments before, she had not had the slightest conception. Edward had gone with the baroness in the other direction towards the ponds. This ready witted lady, who liked to be in the secret about everything, soon observed in a few conversational feelers which she threw out, that Edward was very fluent and free-spoken in praise of Ottilie. She contrived in the most natural way to lead him out by degrees so completely, that at last she had not a doubt remaining, that here was not merely an incipient fancy, but a veritable full-grown passion. Married women, if they have no particular love for one another, yet are silently in league together, especially against young girls. The consequences of such an inclination presented themselves only too quickly to her world-experienced spirit. Added to this, she had been already, in the course of the day, talking to Charlotte about Ottilie. She had disapproved of her remaining in the country, particularly being a girl of so retiring a character, and she had proposed to take Ottilie with her to the residence of a friend, who was just then bestowing great expense on the education of an only daughter, and was only looking about to find some well-disposed companion for her to put her in the place of a second child, and let her share in every advantage. Charlotte had taken time to consider, but now this glimpse of the baroness into Edward's heart changed what had been but a suggestion at once into a settled determination, and the more rapidly she made up her mind about it, the more she outwardly seemed to flatter Edward's wishes. Never was there any one more self-possessed than this lady, and to have mastered ourselves in extraordinary cases disposes us to treat even a common case with dissimulation. It makes us inclined, as we have had to do so much violence to ourselves, to extend our control over others, and hold ourselves in a degree compensated in what we outwardly gain, for what we inwardly have been obliged to sacrifice. To this feeling there is often joined a kind of secret spiteful pleasure in the blind, unconscious ignorance with which the victim walks on into the snare. It is not the immediately doing as we please which we enjoy, but the thought of the surprise and exposure which is to follow and thus was the baroness malicious enough to invite Edward to come with Charlotte, and pay her a visit at the grape-gathering, and to his question whether they might bring Ottilie with them, to frame an answer which, if he pleased, he might interpret to his wishes. Edward had already begun to pour out his delight at the beautiful scenery, the broad river, the hills, the rocks, the vineyard, the old castle, the water-parties, and the jubilee at the grape-gathering, the wine-pressing, etc., in all of which, in the innocence of his heart, he was only exuberating, in the anticipation of the impression which these scenes were to make on the fresh spirit of Ottilie. At this moment they saw her approaching, and the baroness said quickly to Edward that he had better say nothing to her of this intended autumn expedition, things which we set our heart upon so long before, so often failing to come to pass. Edward gave his promise, but he obliged his companion to move more quickly to meet her, and at last when they came very close he ran on several steps in advance. A heartfelt happiness expressed itself in his whole being. He kissed her hand as he pressed into it a nosegay of wild flowers which he had gathered on his way. The baroness felt bitter to the heart at the sight of it. At the same time that she was able to disapprove of what was really objectionable in this affection, she could not bear to see what was sweet and beautiful in it thrown away on such a poor, paltry girl. When they had collected again at the supper-table, an entirely different temper was spread over the party. The Count, who had in the meantime written his letter and dispatched a messenger with it, occupied himself with the captain, whom he had been drawing out more and more, spending the whole evening at his side, talking of serious matters. The Baroness, who sat on the Count's right, found but small amusement in this, nor did Edward find any more. The latter, first because he was thirsty and then because he was excited, did not spare the wine, and attached himself entirely to Ottilie, whom he had made sit by him. On the other side, next to the captain, sat Charlotte. For her it was hard, it was almost impossible, to conceal the emotion under which she was suffering. The baroness had sufficient time to make her observations at leisure. She perceived Charlotte's uneasiness, and occupied as she was with Edward's passion for Ottilie, she easily satisfied herself that her abstraction and distress were owing to her husband's behaviour, 
and she set herself to consider in which way she could best compass her ends supper was over and the party remained divided the count whose object was to probe the captain to the bottom had to try many turns before he could arrive at what he wished with so quiet so little vain but so exceedingly laconic a person they walked up and down together on one side of the saloon while edward excited with wine and hope was laughing with ottilie at a window and charlotte and the baroness were walking backwards and forwards without speaking on the other side their being so silent and their standing about in this uneasy listless way had its effect at last in breaking up the rest of the party the ladies withdrew to their rooms the gentlemen to the other wing of the castle and so this day appeared to be concluded End of chapter 10chapter eleven of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter eleven edward went with the count to his room they continued talking and he was easily prevailed upon to stay a little longer there the count lost himself in old times spoke eagerly of charlotte's beauty which as a critic he dwelt upon with much warmth a pretty foot is a great gift of nature he said it is a grace which never perishes i observed it to-day as she was walking i would almost have liked to have kissed her shoe and repeat that somewhat barbarous but significant practice of the sarmatians who know no better way of showing reverence for any one they love or respect than by using his shoe to drink his health out of the point of the foot did not remain the only subject of praise between two old acquaintances they went from the person back upon old stories and adventures and came on the hindrances which at that time people had thrown in the way of lovers meetings what trouble they had taken what art they had been obliged to devise only to be able to tell each other that they loved do you remember continued the count an adventure in which i most unselfishly stood your friend when their high mightinesses were on a visit to your uncle and were all together in that great straggling castle the day went in festivities and glitter of all sorts and a part of the night at least in pleasant conversation and you in the meantime had observed the back way which led to the court lady's quarters said edward and so managed to effect an interview for me with my beloved and she replied the count thinking more of propriety than of my enjoyment had kept a frightful old duenna with her so that while you two between looks and words got on extremely well together my lot in the meanwhile was far from pleasant it was only yesterday answered edward when we heard that you were coming that i was talking over the story with my wife and describing our adventure on returning we missed the road and got into the entrance hall from the garden knowing our way from thence so well as we did we supposed we could get along easily enough but you remember our surprise on opening the door the floor was covered with mattresses on which the giants lay in rows stretched out and sleeping the single sentinel at his post looked wonderingly at us but we in the cool way young men do things strode quietly on over the outstretched boots without disturbing a single one of the snoring children of anak i had the strongest inclination to stumble the count said that there might be an alarm given what a resurrection we should have witnessed at this moment the castle clock struck twelve it is deep midnight the count added laughing and just the proper time i must ask you my dear baron to show me a kindness do you guide me to-night as i guided you then i promised the baroness that i would see her before going to bed we have had no opportunity of any private talk together the whole day we have not seen each other for a long time and it is only natural that we should wish for a confidential hour if you'll show me the way there i will manage to get back again and in any case there will be no boots for me to stumble over i shall be very glad to show you such a piece of hospitality answered edward only the three ladies are together in the same wing who knows whether we shall not find them still with one another or make some other mistake which may have a strange appearance do not be afraid said the count the baroness expects me she is sure by this time to be in her own room and alone well then the thing is easy enough edward answered he took a candle and lighted the count down a private staircase leading into a long gallery at the end of this he opened a small door they mounted a winding flight of stairs which brought them out upon a narrow landing-place and then putting the candle in the count's hand he pointed to a tapestried door on the right which opened readily at the first trial and admitted the count leaving edward outside in the dark another door on the left led into charlotte's sleeping-room he heard her voice and listened she was speaking to her maid is ottilie in bed she asked no was the answer she is sitting writing in the room below you may light the night lamp said charlotte i shall not want you any more it is late i can put out the candle and do whatever i may want else myself it was a delight to edward to hear that ottilie was writing still she is working for me he thought triumphantly through the darkness he fancied he could see her sitting all alone at her desk 
he thought he would go to her and see her and how she would turn to receive him he felt a longing which he could not resist to be near her once more but from where he was there was no way to the apartments which she occupied he now found himself immediately at his wife's door a singular change of feeling came over him he tried the handle but the bolts were shot he knocked gently charlotte did not hear him she was walking rapidly up and down in the large dressing-room adjoining she was repeating over and over what since the count's unexpected proposal she had often enough had to say to herself the captain seemed to stand before her at home and everywhere he had become her all in all and now he was to go and it was all to be desolate again she repeated whatever wise things one can say to oneself she even anticipated as people so often do the wretched comfort that time would come at last to her relief and then she cursed the time which would have to pass before it could lighten her sufferings she cursed the dead cold time when they would be lightened at last she burst into tears they were the more welcome since tears with her were rare she flung herself on the sofa and gave herself up unreservedly to her sufferings edward meanwhile could not take himself from the door he knocked again and a third time rather louder so that charlotte in the stillness of the night distinctly heard it and started up in fright her first thought was it can only be it must be the captain her second that it was impossible she thought she must have been deceived but surely she had heard it and she wished and she feared to have heard it she went into her sleeping-room and walked lightly up to the bolted tapestry door she blamed herself for her fears possibly it may be the baroness wanting something she said to herself and she called out quietly and calmly is anybody there a light voice answered it is i who returned charlotte not being able to make out the voice she thought she saw the captain's figure standing at the door in a rather louder tone she heard the word edward she drew back the bolt and her husband stood before her he greeted her with some light jest she was unable to reply in the same tone he complicated the mysterious visit by his mysterious explanation of it well then he said at last i will confess the real reason why i am come is that i have made a vow to kiss your shoe this evening it is long since you thought of such a thing as that said charlotte so much the worse he answered and so much the better she had thrown herself back in an armchair to prevent him from seeing the slightness of her dress he flung himself down before her and she could not prevent him from giving her shoe a kiss and when the shoe came off in his hand he caught her foot and pressed it tenderly against his breast charlotte was one of those women who being of a naturally calm temperament continue in marriage without any purpose or any effort the air and character of lovers she was never expressive towards her husband generally indeed she rather shrank from any warm demonstration on his part it was not that she was cold or at all hard and repulsive but she remained always like a loving bride who draws back with a kind of shyness even from what is permitted and so edward found her this evening in a double sense how sorely did she not long that her husband would go the figure of his friend seemed to hover in the air and reproach her but what should have had the effect of driving edward away only attracted him the more there were visible traces of emotion about her she had been crying and tears which with weak persons detract from their graces add immeasurably to the attractiveness of those whom we know commonly as strong and self-possessed edward was so agreeable so gentle so pressing he begged to be allowed to stay with her he did not demand it but half in fun half in earnest he tried to persuade her he never thought of his rights at last as in mischief he blew out the candle in the dim lamplight the inward affection the imagination maintained their rights over the real it was ottilie that was resting in edward's arms and the captain now faintly now clearly hovered before charlotte's soul and so strangely intermingled the absent and the present flowed in a sweet enchantment one into the other and yet the present would not let itself be robbed of its own unlovely right they spent a part of the night talking and laughing at all sorts of things the more freely as the heart had no part in it but when edward awoke in the morning on his wife's breast the day seemed to stare in with a sad awful look and the sun to be shining in upon a crime he stole lightly from her side and she found herself with strange enough feelings when she awoke alone End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter twelve when the party assembled again at breakfast 
an attentive observer might have read in the behaviour of its various members the different things which were passing in their inner thoughts and feelings the count and the baroness met with the air of happiness which a pair of lovers feel who after having been forced to endure a long separation have mutually assured each other of their unaltered affection on the other hand charlotte and edward equally came into the presence of the captain and ottilie with a sense of shame and remorse for such is the nature of love that it believes in no rights except its own and all other rights vanish away before it ottilie was in childlike spirits for her she was almost what might be called open the captain appeared serious his conversation with the count which had roused in him feelings that for some time past had been at rest and dormant had made him only too keenly conscious that here he was not fulfilling his work and at bottom was but squandering himself in a half activity of idleness hardly had their guests departed when fresh visitors were announced to charlotte most welcomely all she wished for being to be taken out of herself and to have her attention dissipated they annoyed edward who was longing to devote himself to ottilie and ottilie did not like them either the copy which had to be finished the next morning early being still incomplete they stayed a long time and immediately that they were gone she hurried off to her room it was now evening edward charlotte and the captain had accompanied the strangers some little way on foot before the latter got into their carriage and previous to returning home they agreed to take a walk along the water-side a boat had come which edward had had fetched from a distance at no little expense and they decided that they would try whether it was easy to manage it was made fast on the bank of the middle pond not far from some old ash trees on which they calculated to make an effect in their future improvements there was to be a landing place made there and under the trees a seat was to be raised with some wonderful architecture about it it was to be the point for which people were to make when they went across the water and where had we better have the landing place on the other side said edward i should think under my plane trees they stand a little too far to the right said the captain you are nearer the castle if you land further down however we must think about it the captain was already standing in the stern of the boat and had taken up an oar charlotte got in and edward with her he took the other oar but as he was on the point of pushing off he thought of ottilie he recollected that this water party would keep him out late who could tell when he would get back he made up his mind shortly and promptly sprang back to the bank and reaching the other oar to the captain hurried home making excuses to himself as he ran arriving there he learnt that ottilie had shut herself up she was writing in spite of the agreeable feeling that she was doing something for him it was the keenest mortification to him not to be able to see her his impatience increased every moment he walked up and down the large drawing-room he tried a thousand things and could not fix his attention upon any he was longing to see her alone before charlotte came back with the captain it was dark by this time and the candles were lighted at last she came in beaming with loveliness the sense that she had done something for her friend had lifted all her being above itself she put down the original and her transcript on the table before edward shall we collate them she said with a smile edward did not know what to answer he looked at her he looked at the transcript the first few sheets were written with the greatest carefulness in a delicate woman's hand then the strokes appeared to alter to become more light and free but who can describe his surprise as he ran his eyes over the concluding page for heaven's sakes he cried what is this this is my hand he looked at ottilie and again at the paper the conclusion especially was exactly as if he had written it himself ottilie said nothing but she looked at him with her eyes full of the warmest delight edward stretched out his arms you love me he cried ottilie you love me they fell on each other's breast which had been the first to catch the other would have been impossible to distinguish from that moment the world was all changed for edward he was no longer what he had been and the world was no longer what it had been they parted he held her hands they gazed in each other's eyes they were on the point of embracing each other again charlotte entered with the captain edward inwardly smiled at the excuses for having stayed out so long oh how far too soon you have returned he said to himself they sat down to supper they talked about the people who had been there that day edward full of love and ecstasy spoke well of every one always sparing often approving charlotte who was not altogether of his opinion remarked this temper in him and jested with him about it he who had always the sharpest thing to say on departed visitors was this evening so gentle and tolerant with fervour and heartfelt conviction edward cried one has only to love a single creature with all one's heart 
and the whole world at once looks lovely ottilie dropped her eyes on the ground and charlotte looked straight before her the captain took up the word and said it is the same with deep feelings of respect and reverence we first learn to recognize what there is that is to be valued in the world when we find occasion to entertain such sentiments towards a particular object charlotte made an excuse to retire early to her room where she could give herself up to thinking over what had passed in the course of the evening between herself and the captain when edward sprang on shore and pushing off the boat had himself committed his wife and his friend to the uncertain element charlotte found herself face to face with the man on whose account she had been already secretly suffering so bitterly sitting in the twilight before her and sweeping along the boat with the sculls in easy motion she felt a depth of sadness very rare with her weighing on her spirits the undulating movement of the boat the splash of the oars the faint breeze playing over the watery mirror the sighing of the reeds the long flight of the birds the fitful twinkling of the first stars there was something spectral about it all in the universal stillness she fancied her friend was bearing her away to set her on some far-off shore and leave her there alone strange emotions were passing through her and she could not give way to them and weep the captain was describing to her the manner in which in his opinion the improvement should be continued he praised the construction of the boat it was so convenient he said because one person could so easily manage it with a pair of oars she should herself learn how to do this there was often a delicious feeling in floating along alone upon the water one's own ferryman and steersman the parting which was impending sank on charlotte's heart as he was speaking is he saying this on purpose she thought to herself does he know it yet does he suspect it or is it only accident and is he unconsciously foretelling me my fate a weary impatient heaviness took hold of her she begged him to make for land as soon as possible and return with her to the castle it was the first time that the captain had been upon the water and though generally he had acquainted himself with its step he did not know accurately the particular spots dusk was coming on he directed his course to a place where he thought it would be easy to get on shore and from which he knew the footpath which led to the castle was not far distant charlotte however repeated her wish to get to land quickly and the place which he thought of being at a short distance he gave it up and exerting himself as much as he possibly could made straight for the bank unhappily the water was shallow and he ran aground some way off from it from the rate at which he was going the boat was fixed fast and all his efforts to move it were in vain what was to be done there was no alternative but to get into the water and carry his companion ashore it was done without difficulty or danger he was strong enough not to totter with her or give her any cause for anxiety but in her agitation she had thrown her arms about his neck he held her fast and pressed her to himself and at last laid her down upon a grassy bank not without emotion and confusion she still lay upon his neck he caught her up once more in his arms and pressed a warm kiss upon her lips the next moment he was at her feet he took her hand and held it to his mouth and cried charlotte will you forgive me the kiss which he had ventured to give and which she had all but returned to him brought charlotte to herself again she pressed his hand but she did not attempt to raise him up she bent down over him and laid her hand upon his shoulder and said we cannot now prevent this moment from forming an epoch in our lives but it depends on us to bear ourselves in a manner which shall be worthy of us you must go away my dear friend and you are going the count has plans for you to give you better prospects i am glad and i am sorry i did not mean to speak of it till it was certain but this moment obliges me to tell you my secret since it does not depend on ourselves to alter our feelings i can only forgive you i can only forgive myself if we have the courage to alter our situation she raised him up took his arm to support herself and they walked back to the castle without speaking but now she was standing in her own room where she had to feel and to know that she was edward's wife her strength and the various discipline in which through life she had trained herself came to her assistance in the conflict accustomed as she had always been to look steadily into herself and to control herself she did not now find it difficult with an earnest effort to come to the resolution which she desired she could almost smile when she remembered the strange visit of the night before suddenly she was seized with a wonderful instinctive feeling a thrill of fearful delight which changed into holy hope and longing she knelt earnestly down and repeated the oath which she had taken to edward before the altar friendship affection renunciation floated in glad happy images before her she felt restored to health and to herself a sweet weariness came over her 
she lay down and sunk into a calm quiet sleep end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Elective Affinities. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter Thirteen. Edward, on his part, was in a very different temper. So little he thought of sleeping that it did not once occur to him even to undress himself. A thousand times he kissed the transcript of the document but it was the beginning of it in ottilie's childish timid hand the end he scarcely dared to kiss for he thought it was his own hand which he saw oh that it were another document he whispered to himself and as it was he felt it was the sweetest assurance that his highest wish would be fulfilled thus it remained in his hands thus he continued to press it to his heart although disfigured by a third name subscribed to it the waning moon rose up over the wood the warmth of the night drew edward out into the free air he wandered this way and that way he was at once the most restless and the happiest of mortals he strayed through the gardens they seemed too narrow for him he hurried out into the park and it was too wide he was drawn back toward the castle he stood under ottilie's window he threw himself down on the steps of the terrace below walls and bolts he said to himself may still divide us but our hearts are not divided if she were here before me into my arms she would fall and i into hers and what can one desire but that sweet certainty all was stillness round him not a breath was moving so still it was that he could hear the unresting creatures underground at their work to whom day or night are alike he abandoned himself to his delicious dreams at last he fell asleep and did not wake till the sun with his royal beams was mounting up in the sky and scattering the early mists he found himself the first person awake on his domain the labourers seemed to be staying away too long they came he thought they were too few and the work set out for the day too slight for his desires he inquired for more workmen they were promised and in the course of the day they came but these too were not enough for him to carry his plans out as rapidly as he wished to do the work gave him no pleasure any longer it should all be done and for whom the paths should be gravel that ottilie might walk pleasantly upon them seats should be made at every spot and corner that ottilie might rest on them the new park-house was hurried forward it should be finished for ottilie's birthday in all he thought and all he did there was no more moderation the sense of loving and of being loved urged him out into the unlimited how changed was now to him the look of all the rooms their furniture and their decorations he did not feel as if he was in his own house any more ottilie's presence absorbed everything he was utterly lost in her no other thought ever rose before him no conscience disturbed him every restraint which had been laid upon his nature burst loose his whole being centred upon ottilie this impetuosity of passion did not escape the captain who longed if he could to prevent its evil consequences all those plans which were now being hurried on with this immoderate speed had been drawn out and calculated for a long quiet easy execution the sale of the farm had been completed the first instalment had been paid charlotte according to the arrangement had taken possession of it but the very first week after she found it more than usually necessary to exercise patience and resolution and to keep her eye on what was being done in the present hasty style of proceeding the money which had been set apart for the purpose would not go far much had been begun and much yet remained to be done how could the captain leave charlotte in such a situation they consulted together and agreed that it would be better that they themselves should hurry on the works and for this purpose employ money which could be made good again at the period fixed for the discharge of the second instalment of what was to be paid for the farm it could be done almost without loss they would have a freer hand everything would progress simultaneously there were labourers enough at hand and they could get more accomplished at once and arrive swiftly and surely at their aim edward gladly gave his consent to a plan which so entirely coincided with his own views during this time charlotte persisted with all her heart in what she had determined for herself and her friends stood by her with a like purpose manfully this very circumstance however produced a greater intimacy between them they spoke openly to one another of edward's passion and consulted what had better be done charlotte kept utterly more about herself watching her narrowly and the more she understood her own heart the deeper she was able to penetrate into the heart of the poor girl 
she saw no help for it except in sending her away it now appeared a happy thing to her that luciana had gained such high honours at the school for her great-aunt as soon as she heard of it desired to take her entirely to herself to keep her with her and bring her out into the world ottilie could therefore return thither the captain would leave them well provided for and everything would be as it had been a few months before indeed in many respects better her own position in edward's affection charlotte thought she could soon recover and she settled it all and laid it all out before herself so sensibly that she only strengthened herself more completely in her delusion as if it were possible for them to return within their old limits as if a bond which had been violently broken could again be joined together as before in the meantime edward felt very deeply the hindrances which were thrown in his way he soon observed that they were keeping him and ottilie separate that they made it difficult for him to speak with her alone or even to approach her except in the presence of others and while he was angry about this he was angry at many things besides if he caught an opportunity for a few hasty words with ottilie it was not only to assure her of his love but to complain of his wife and of the captain he never felt that with his own irrational haste he was on the way to exhaust the cash-box he found bitter fault with them because in the execution of the work they were not keeping to the first agreement and yet he had been himself a consenting party to the second indeed it was he who had occasioned it and made it necessary hatred is a partisan but love is even more so ottilie also estranged herself from charlotte and the captain as edward was complaining one day to ottilie of the latter saying that he was not treating him like a friend or under the circumstances acting quite uprightly she answered unthinkingly i have once or twice had a painful feeling that he was not quite honest with you i heard him say once to charlotte if edward would but spare us that eternal flute of his he can make nothing of it and it is too disagreeable to listen to him you may imagine how it hurt me when i like accompanying you so much she had scarcely uttered the words when her conscience whispered to her that she had much better have been silent however the thing was said edward's features worked violently never had anything stung him more he was touched on his tenderest point it was his amusement he followed it like a child he never made the slightest pretensions what gave him pleasure should be treated with forbearance by his friends he never thought how intolerable it is for a third person to have his ears lacerated by an unsuccessful talent he was indignant he was hurt in a way which he could not forgive he felt himself discharged from all obligations the necessity of being with ottilie of seeing her whispering to her exchanging his confidence with her increased with every day he determined to write to her and ask her to carry on a secret correspondence with him the strip of paper on which he had laconically enough made his request lay on his writing-table and was swept off by a draught of wind as his valet entered to dress his hair the latter was in the habit of trying the heat of the iron by picking up any scraps of paper which might be lying about this time his hand fell on the billet he twisted it up hastily and it was burnt edward observing the mistake snatched it out of his hand after the man was gone he sat himself down to write it over again the second time it would not run so readily off his pen it gave him a little uneasiness he hesitated but he got over it he squeezed the paper into ottilie's hand the first moment he was able to approach her ottilie answered him immediately he put the note unread in his waistcoat pocket which being made short in the fashion of the time was shallow and did not hold it as it ought it worked out and fell without his observing it on the ground charlotte saw it picked it up and after giving a hasty glance at it reached it to him here is something in your handwriting she said which you may be sorry to lose he was confounded is she dissembling he thought to himself does she know what is in the note or is she deceived by the resemblance of the hand he hoped he believed the latter he was warned doubly warned but those strange accidents through which our high intelligence seems to be speaking to us his passion was not able to interpret rather as he went further and further on he felt the restraint under which his friend and his wife seemed to be holding him the more intolerable his pleasure in their society was gone his heart was closed against them and though he was obliged to endure their society he could not succeed in rediscovering or reanimating within his heart anything of his old affection for them the silent reproaches which he was forced to make to himself about it were disagreeable to him he tried to help himself with a kind of humour which however being without love was also without its usual grace over all such trials charlotte found assistance to rise in her own inward feelings she knew her own determination 
her own affection fair and noble as it was she would utterly renounce and sorely she longed to go to the assistance of the other two separation she knew well would not alone suffice to heal so deep a wound she resolved that she would speak openly about it to ottilie herself but she could not do it the recollection of her own weakness stood in her way she thought she could talk generally to her about the sort of thing but general expressions about the sort of thing fitted her own case equally well and she could not bear to touch it every hint which she would give ottilie recoiled back on her own heart she would warn and she was obliged to feel that she might herself still be in need of warning she contented herself therefore with silently keeping the lovers more apart and by this gained nothing the slight hints which frequently escaped her had no effect upon ottilie for ottilie had been assured by edward that charlotte was devoted to the captain that charlotte herself wished for a separation and he was at this moment considering the readiest means by which it could be brought about ottilie led by the sense of her own innocence along the road to the happiness for which she longed only lived for edward strengthened by her love for him in all good more light and happy in her work for his sake and more frank and open towards others she found herself in a heaven upon earth so altogether each in his or her own fashion reflecting or unreflecting they continued on the routine of their lives all seemed to go its ordinary way as in monstrous cases when everything is at stake men will still live on as if it were all nothing End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von goethe chapter fourteen in the meantime a letter came from the count to the captain two indeed one which he might produce holding out fair excellent prospects in the distance the other containing a distinct offer of an immediate situation a place of high importance and responsibility at the court his rank as major a very considerable salary and other advantages a number of circumstances however made it desirable that for the moment he should not speak of it and consequently he only informed his friends of his distant expectations and concealed what was so nearly impending he went warmly on at the same time with his present occupation and quietly made arrangements to secure the works being all continued without interruption after his departure he was now himself desirous that as much as possible should be finished off at once and was ready to hasten things forward to prepare for ottilie's birthday and so though without having come to any express understanding the two friends worked side by side together edward was now well pleased that the cash-box was filled by their having taken up money the whole affair went forward at fullest speed the captain had done his best to oppose the plan of throwing the three ponds together into a single sheet of water the lower embankment would have to be made much stronger the two intermediate embankments to be taken away and altogether in more than one sense it seemed a very questionable proceeding however both these schemes had been already undertaken the soil which was removed above being carried at once down to where it was wanted and here there came opportunely on the scene a young architect an old pupil of the captain who partly by introducing workmen who understood work of this nature and partly by himself whenever it was possible contracting for the work itself advanced things not a little while at the same time they could feel more confidence in their being securely and lastingly executed in secret this was a great pleasure to the captain he could now be confident that his absence would not be so severely felt it was one of the points on which he was most resolute with himself never to leave anything which he had taken in hand uncompleted unless he could see his place satisfactorily supplied and he could not but hold in small respect persons who introduce confusion around themselves only to make their absence felt and are ready to disturb in wanton selfishness what they will not be at hand to restore so they laboured on straining every nerve to make ottilie's birthday splendid without any open acknowledgment that this was what they were aiming at or indeed without their directly acknowledging it to themselves charlotte wholly free from jealousy as she was could not think it right to keep it as a real festival ottilie's youth the circumstances of her fortune and her relationship to their family were not at all such as made it fit that she should appear as the queen of the day and edward would not have it talked about because everything was to spring out as it were of itself with a natural and delightful surprise they therefore came all of them to a sort of tacit understanding that on this day without further circumstance the new house in the park was to be opened 
and they might take the occasion to invite the neighbourhood and give a holiday to their own people. Edward's passion, however, knew no bounds. Longing as he did to give himself to Ottilie, his presence and his promises must be infinite. The birthday gifts, which on the great occasion he was to offer to her seemed, as Charlotte had arranged them, far too insignificant. He spoke to his valet, who had the care of his wardrobe, and who consequently had extensive acquaintance among the tailors and mercers and fashionable milliners, and he, who not only understood himself what valuable presents were, but also the most graceful way in which they should be offered, immediately ordered an elegant box covered with red morocco and studded with steel nails, to be filled with presents worthy of such a shell. Another thing, too, he suggested to Edward. Among the stores at the castle was a small show of fireworks which had never been let off, it would be easy to get some more and have something really fine edward caught the idea and his servant promised to see to its being executed this matter was to remain a secret while this was going on the captain as the day drew nearer had been making arrangements for a body of police to be present a precaution which he always thought desirable when large numbers of men are to be brought together and indeed against beggars and against all other inconveniences by which the pleasure of a festival can be disturbed he had made effectual provision. Edward and his confidant, on the contrary, were mainly occupied with their fireworks. They were to be let off on the side of the middle water in front of the great ash-tree. The party were to be collected on the opposite side, under the plains, that, at a sufficient distance from the scene, in ease and safety, they might see them to the best effect, with the reflections on the water, the water-rockets and floating lights, and all the other designs. Under some other pretext, Edward had the ground underneath the plane trees cleared of bushes and grass and moss, and now first could be seen the beauty of their forms, together with their full height and spread, right up from the earth. He was delighted with them. It was just this very time of the year that he had planted them. How long ago could it have been? he said to himself. As soon as he got home, he turned over the old diary books which his father, especially when in the country, was very careful in keeping. He might not find an entry of this particular planting, but another important domestic matter which Edward well remembered, and which had occurred on the same day, would surely be mentioned. He turned over a few volumes. The circumstance he was looking for was there. How amazed, how overjoyed he was, when he discovered the strangest coincidence! The day and the year on which he had planted those trees was the very day, the very year, when Ottilie was born. End of chapter 14《ハッピーオブエレクティブアフィニティス》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Elective Affinities by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 15 The long-wished-for morning dawned at last on Edward, and very soon a number of guests arrived. They had sent out a large number of invitations, and many who had missed the laying of the foundation stone which was reported to have been so charming, were the more careful not to be absent on the second festivity. Before dinner the carpenter's people appeared, with music, in the court of the castle. They bore an immense garland of flowers, composed of a number of single wreaths, winding in and out, one above the other. Saluting the company, they made request, according to custom, for silk handkerchiefs and ribbons, at the hands of the fair sex, with which to dress themselves out. When the castle party went into the dining-hall, they marched off singing and shouting, and after amusing themselves a while in the village, and coaxing many a ribbon out of the women there, old and young, they came at last, with crowds behind them and crowds expecting them, out upon the height where the park-house was now standing. After dinner, Charlotte rather held back her guests. She did not wish that there should be any solemn or formal procession, and they found their way in little parties broken up, as they pleased, without rule or order, to the scene of action. Charlotte stayed behind with Ottilie, and did not improve matters by doing so. For Ottilie being really the last that appeared, it seemed as if the trumpets and the clarinets had only been waiting for her, and as if the gaieties had been ordered to commence directly on her arrival. To take off the rough appearance of the house, it had been hung with green boughs and flowers. They had dressed it out in an architectural fashion, according to a design of the captain's, only that, without his knowledge, Edward had desired the architect to work in the date upon the corners in flowers, and this was necessarily permitted to remain. The captain had only arrived on the scene in time to prevent Ottilie's name from figuring in splendour on the gable. The beginning, which had been made for this, he contrived to turn skilfully to some other use, and to get rid of such of the letters as had been already finished. 
The garland was set up, and was to be seen far and wide about the country. The flags and the ribbons fluttered gaily in the air, and a short oration was, the greater part of it, dispersed by the wind. The solemnity was at an end. There was now to be a dance on the smooth lawn, in front of the building, which had been enclosed with boughs and branches. A gaily dressed working mason took Edward up to a smart-looking girl of the village, and called himself upon Ottilie, who stood out with him. These two couples speedily found others to follow them, and Edward contrived pretty soon to change partners, catching Ottilie and making the round with her. The younger part of the company joined merrily in the dance with the people, while the elder among them stood and looked on. Then before they broke up and walked about, an order was given that they should all collect again at sunset under the plane trees. Edward was the first upon the spot, ordering everything and making his arrangements with his valet, who was to be on the other side, in company with the firework maker managing his exhibition of the spectacle the captain was far from satisfied at some of the preparations which he saw made and he endeavoured to get a word with edward about the crush of spectators which was to be expected but the latter somewhat hastily begged that he might be allowed to manage this part of the day's amusements himself the upper end of the embankment having been recently raised was still far from compact it had been staked but there was no grass upon it and the earth was uneven and insecure the crowd pressed on however in great numbers the sun went down and the castle party was served with refreshments under the plane trees to pass the time till it should have become sufficiently dark the place was approved of beyond measure and they looked forward to frequently enjoying the view over so lovely a sheet of water on future occasions a calm evening a perfect absence of wind promised everything in favour of the spectacle when suddenly loud and violent shrieks were heard large masses of the earth had given way on the edge of the embankment and a number of people were precipitated into the water the pressure from the throng had gone on increasing till at last it had become more than the newly laid soil would bear and the bank had fallen in everybody wanted to obtain the best place and now there was no getting either backwards or forwards people ran this and that way more to see what was going on than to render assistance what could be done when no one could reach the place the captain, with a few determined persons, hurried down and drove the crowd off the embankment back upon the shore, in order that those who were really of service might have free room to move. One way or another they contrived to seize hold of such as were sinking, and with or without assistance, all who had been in the water were got out safe upon the bank, with the exception of one boy, whose struggles in his fright, instead of bringing him nearer to the embankment, had only carried him further from it. His strength seemed to be failing, now only a hand was seen above the surface, and now a foot. By an unlucky chance the boat was on the opposite shore filled with fireworks. It was a long business to unload it, and help was slow in coming. The captain's resolution was taken. He flung off his coat, all eyes were directed towards him, and his sturdy, vigorous figure gave every one hope and confidence. But a cry of surprise rose out of the crowd as they saw him fling himself into the water. Every eye watched him as the strong swimmer swiftly reached the boy and bore him, although to appearance dead, to the embankment. Now came up the boat. The captain stepped in and examined whether there were any still missing, or whether they were all safe. The surgeon was speedily on the spot, and took charge of the inanimate boy. Charlotte joined them, and entreated the captain to go now and take care of himself, to hurry back to the castle and change his clothes. He would not go, however, till persons on whose sense he could rely, who had been close to the spot at the time of the accident, and who had assisted in saving those who had fallen in, assured him that all were safe charlotte saw him on his way to the house and then she remembered that the wine and the tea and everything else which he could want had been locked up for fear any of the servants should take advantage of the disorder of the holiday as on such occasions they are too apt to do she hurried through the scattered groups of her company which were loitering about the plane trees edward was there talking to every one beseeching every one to stay he would give the signal directly and the fireworks should begin charlotte went up to him and entreated him to put off an amusement which was no longer in place and which at the present moment no one could enjoy she reminded him of what ought to be done for the boy who had been saved and for his preserver the surgeon will do whatever is right no doubt replied edward he is provided with everything which he can want and we should only be in the way if we crowded about him with our anxieties charlotte persisted in her opinion and made a sign to ottilie who at once prepared to retire with her edward seized her hand and cried we will not end this day in a lazaretto she is too good for a sister of mercy without us i should think the half-dead may wake and the living dry themselves charlotte did not answer but went some followed her others followed these in the end no one wished to be the last and all followed 
Edward and Ottilie found themselves alone under the plane trees. He insisted that stay he would, earnestly, passionately, as she entreated him to go back with her to the castle. No, Ottilie, he cried. The extraordinary is not brought to pass in the smooth, common way. The wonderful accident of this evening brings us more speedily together. You are mine. I have often said it to you, and sworn it to you. We will not say it and swear it any more. We will make it be. The boat came over from the other side. The valet was in it. He asked with some embarrassment what his master wished to have done with the fireworks. Let them off, Edward cried to him. Let them off. It was only for you that they were provided, Ottilie, and you shall be the only one to see them. Let me sit beside you and enjoy them with you. Tenderly, timidly, he sat down at her side without touching her. Rockets went hissing up, cannon thundered, Roman candles shot out their blazing balls, scribs flashed and darted, wheels spun round, first singly, then in pairs, then all at once, faster and faster, one after the other, and more and more together. Edward, whose bosom was on fire, watched the blazing spectacle with eyes gleaming with delight. But Ottilie, with her delicate and nervous feelings, in all this noise and fitful blazing and flashing, found more to distress her than to please. She leant shrinking against Edward, and he, as she drew to him and clung to him, felt the delightful sense that she belonged entirely to him. The night had scarcely reassumed its rights, when the moon rose and lighted their path as they walked back. A figure, with his hat in his hand, stepped across their way, and begged in alms of them. In the general holiday he said that he had been forgotten. The moon shone upon his face, and Edward recognised the features of the importunate beggar. But happy as he then was, it was impossible for him to be angry with any one. He could not recollect that, especially for that particular day, begging had been forbidden under the heaviest penalties. He thrust his hand into his pocket, took the first coin which he found, and gave the fellow a piece of gold. His own happiness was so unbounded that he would have liked to have shared it with every one. In the meantime, all had gone well at the castle. The skill of the surgeon, everything which was required being ready at hand, Charlotte's assistance, all had worked together, and the boy was brought to life again. The guest dispersed wishing to catch a glimpse or two of what was to be seen of the fireworks from the distance, and after a scene of such confusion were glad to get back to their own quiet homes. The captain also, after having rapidly changed his dress, had taken an active part in what required to be done. It was now all quiet again, and he found himself alone with Charlotte. Gently and affectionately, he now told her that his time for leaving them approached. She had gone through so much that evening that this discovery made but a slight impression upon her, she had seen how her friend could sacrifice himself, how he had saved another, and had himself been saved. These strange incidents seemed to foretell an important future to her, but not an unhappy one. Edward, who now entered with Ottilie, was informed at once of the impending departure of the captain. He suspected that Charlotte had known longer how near it was, but he was far too much occupied with himself and with his own plans to take it amiss, or care about it. On the contrary, he listened attentively, and with signs of pleasure, to the account of the excellent and honourable position in which the captain was to be placed. The course of the future was hurried impetuously forward by his own secret wishes. Already he saw the captain married to Charlotte, and himself married to Ottilie. It would have been the richest present which any one could have made him on the occasion of the day's festival. But how surprised was Ottilie when, on going to her room, she found upon the table the beautiful box. Instantly she opened it. Inside, all the things were so nicely packed and arranged, that she did not venture to take them out. She scarcely even ventured to lift them. There were muslin, cambric, silk, shawls, and lace, all rivalling each other in delicacy, beauty, and costliness, nor were ornaments forgotten. The intention had been, as she saw well, to furnish her with more than one complete suit of clothes, but it was all so costly, so little like what she had been accustomed to, that she scarcely dared, even in thought, to believe it could be really for her. End of chapter 15《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee.《Elective Affinities》by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Chapter 16 The next morning the captain had disappeared, having left a grateful, feeling letter addressed to his friends upon his table. He and Charlotte had already taken a half leave of each other the evening before. She felt that the parting was forever, and she resigned herself to it. For in the Count's second letter, which the captain had at last shown to her, there was a hint of a prospect of an advantageous marriage, and, although he had paid no attention to it at all, she accepted it for as good as certain, 
and gave him up firmly and fully now therefore she thought that she had a right to require of others the same control over themselves which she had exercised herself it had not been impossible to her and it ought not to be impossible to them with this feeling she began the conversation with her husband and she entered upon it the more openly and easily from a sense that the question must now once for all be decisively set at rest our friend has left us she said we are now once more together as we were and it depends upon ourselves whether we choose to return altogether into our old position edward who heard nothing except what flattered his own passion believed that charlotte in these words was alluding to her previous widowed state and in a roundabout way was making a suggestion for a separation so that he answered with a laugh why not all we want is to come to an understanding but he found himself sorely enough undeceived as charlotte continued and we have now a choice of opportunities for placing ottilie in another situation two openings have offered themselves for her either of which will do very well either she can return to the school as my daughter has left it and is with her great aunt or she can be received into a desirable family where as the companion of an only child she will enjoy all the advantages of a solid education edward with a tolerably successful effort at commanding himself replied ottilie has been so much spoilt by living so long with us here that she will scarcely like to leave us now we have all of us been too much spoilt said charlotte and yourself not least this is an epoch which requires us seriously to bethink ourselves it is a solemn warning to us to consider what is really for the good of all the members of our little circle and we ourselves must not be afraid of making sacrifices at any rate i cannot see that it is right that ottilie should be made a sacrifice replied edward and that would be the case if we were now to allow her to be sent away among strangers the captain's good genius has sought him out here we can feel easy we can feel happy at seeing him leave us but who can tell what may be before ottilie there is no occasion for haste what is before us is sufficiently clear charlotte answered with some emotion and as she was determined to have it all out at once she went on you love ottilie every day you are becoming more attached to her a reciprocal feeling is rising on her side as well and feeding itself in the same way why should we not acknowledge in words what every hour makes obvious and are we not to have the common prudence to ask ourselves in what it is to end we may not be able to find an answer on the moment replied edward collecting himself but so much may be said that if we cannot exactly tell what will come of it we may resign ourselves to wait and see what the future may tell us about it no great wisdom is required to prophesy here answered charlotte and at any rate we ought to feel that you and i are past the age when people may walk blindly where they should not or ought not to go there is no one else to take care of us we must be our own friends our own managers no one expects us to commit ourselves in an outrage upon decency no one expects that we are going to expose ourselves to censure or to ridicule how can you so mistake me said edward unable to reply to his wife's clear open words can you find it a fault in me if i am anxious about ottilie's happiness i do not mean future happiness no one can count on that but what is present palpable and immediate consider don't deceive yourself consider frankly ottilie's case torn away from us and sent to live among strangers i at least am not cruel enough to propose such a change for her charlotte saw too clearly into her husband's intentions through this disguise for the first time she felt how far he had estranged himself from her her voice shook a little will ottilie be happy if she divides us she said if she deprives me of a husband and his children of a father our children i should have thought were sufficiently provided for said edward with a cold smile adding rather more kindly but why at once expect the very worst the very worst is too sure to follow this passion of yours returned charlotte do not refuse good advice while there is yet time do not throw away the means which i propose to save us in troubled cases those must work and help who see the clearest this time it is i dear dearest edward listen to me can you propose to me that now at once i shall renounce my happiness renounce my fairest rights renounce you who says that replied edward with some embarrassment you yourself answered charlotte in determining to keep ottilie here are you not acknowledging everything which must arise out of it i will urge nothing on you but if you cannot conquer yourself at least you will not be able much longer to deceive yourself edward felt how right she was it is fearful to hear spoken out in words what the heart has gone on long permitting to itself in secret to escape only for a moment edward answered it is not yet clear to me what you want my intention she replied was to talk over with you these two proposals 
each of them has its advantages the school would be best suited to her as she now is but the other situation is larger and wider and promises more when i think what she may become she then detailed to her husband circumstantially what would lie before ottilie in each position and concluded with the words for my own part i should prefer the lady's house to the school for more reasons than one but particularly because i should not like the affection the love indeed of the young man there which ottilie has gained to increase edward appeared to approve but it was only to find some means of delay charlotte who desired to commit him to a definite step seized the opportunity as edward made no immediate opposition to settle ottilie's departure for which she had already privately made all preparations for the next day edward shuddered he thought he was betrayed his wife's affectionate speech he fancied was an artfully contrived trick to separate him for ever from his happiness he appeared to leave the thing entirely to her but in his heart his resolution was already taken to gain time to breathe to put off the immediate intolerable misery of ottilie's being sent away he determined to leave his house he told charlotte he was going but he had blinded her to his real reason by telling her that he would not be present at ottilie's departure indeed that from that moment he would see her no more charlotte who believed that she had gained her point approved most cordially he ordered his horse gave his valet the necessary directions what to pack up and where he should follow him and then on the point of departure he sat down and wrote edward to charlotte the misfortune my love which has befallen us may or may not admit of remedy only this i feel that if i am not at once to be driven to despair i must find some means of delay for myself and for all of us in making myself the sacrifice i have a right to make a request i am leaving my home and i only return to it under happier and more peaceful auspices while i am away you keep possession of it but with ottilie i choose to know that she is with you and not among strangers take care of her treat her as you have treated her only more lovingly more kindly more tenderly i promise that i will not attempt any secret intercourse with her leave me as long a time as you please without knowing anything about you i will not allow myself to be anxious nor need you be uneasy about me only with all my heart and soul i beseech you make no attempt to send ottilie away or to introduce her into any other situation beyond the circle of the castle and the park placed in the hands of strangers she belongs to me and i will take possession of her if you have any regard for my affection for my wishes for my sufferings you will leave me alone to my madness and if any hope of recovery from it should ever hereafter offer itself to me i will not resist this last sentence ran off his pen not out of his heart even when he saw it upon the paper he began bitterly to weep that he under any circumstances should renounce the happiness even the wretchedness of loving ottilie he only now began to feel what he was doing he was going away without knowing what was to be the result at any rate he was not to see her again now with what certainty could he promise himself that he would ever see her again but the letter was written the horses were at the door every moment he was afraid he might see ottilie somewhere and then his whole purpose would go to the winds he collected himself he remembered that at any rate he would be able to return at any moment he pleased and that by his absence he would have advanced nearer to his wishes on the other side he pictured ottilie to himself forced to leave the house if he stayed he sealed the letter ran down the steps and sprang upon his horse as he rode past the hotel he saw the beggar to whom he had given so much money the night before sitting under the trees the man was busy enjoying his dinner and as edward passed stood up and made him the humblest obeisance that figure had appeared to him yesterday when ottilie was on his arm now it only served as a bitter reminiscence of the happiest hour of his life his grief redoubled the feeling of what he was leaving behind was intolerable he looked again at the beggar happy wretch he cried you can still feed upon the arms of yesterday and i cannot any more on the happiness of yesterday End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of elective affinities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee elective affinities by johann wolfgang von Goethe. chapter seventeen ottilie heard some one ride away and went to the window in time just to catch a sight of edward's back it was strange she thought that he should have left the house without seeing her without having even wished her good morning she grew uncomfortable and her anxiety did not diminish when charlotte took her out for a long walk and talked of various other things but not once and apparently on purpose mentioning her husband 
When they returned, she found the table laid only with two covers. It is unpleasant to miss even the most trifling thing to which we have been accustomed. In serious things such a loss becomes miserably painful. Edward and the captain were not there. The first time, for a long while, Charlotte sat at the head of the table herself, and it seemed to Ottilie as if she was deposed. The two ladies sat opposite each other. Charlotte talked, without the least embarrassment, of the captain and his appointment, and of the little hope there was of seeing him again for a long time. The only comfort Ottilie could find for herself was in the idea that Edward had ridden after his friend to accompany him a part of his journey. On rising from table, however, they saw Edward's travelling carriage under the window. Charlotte, a little as if she was put out, asked who had it brought round there. She was told it was the valet who had some things there to pack up. It required all Ottilie's self-command to conceal her wonder and her distress. The valet came in and asked if they would be so good as to let him have a drinking-cup of his master's, a pair of silver spoons, and a number of other things, which seemed to Ottilie to imply that he was gone some distance, and would be away for a long time. Charlotte gave him a very cold, dry answer. She did not know what he meant. He had everything belonging to his master under his own care. What the man wanted was to speak a word to Ottilie, and on some pretence or other to get her out of the room. He made some clever excuse, and persisted in his request so far that Ottilie asked if she should go to look for the things for him. But Charlotte quietly said that she had better not. The valet had to depart, and the carriage rolled away. It was a dreadful moment for Ottilie. She understood nothing, comprehended nothing. She could only feel that Edward had been parted from her for a long time. Charlotte felt for her situation, and left her to herself. We will not attempt to describe what she went through, or how she wept. She suffered infinitely. She prayed that God would help her only over this one day. The day passed, and the night, and when she came to herself again she felt herself a changed being. She had not grown composed. She was not resigned. But after having lost what she had lost, she was still alive, and there was still something for her to fear. Her anxiety, after returning to consciousness, was at once lest, now that the gentlemen were gone, she might be sent away too. She never guessed at Edward's threats which had secured her remaining with her aunt, yet Charlotte's manners served partially to reassure her. The latter exerted herself to find employment for the poor girl, and hardly ever, never if she could help it, left her out of her sight. And although she knew well how little words can do against the power of passion, yet she knew too the sure though slow influence of thought and reflection, and therefore missed no opportunity of inducing Ottilie to talk with her on every variety of subject. It was no little comfort to Ottilie when one day Charlotte took an opportunity of making, she did it on purpose, the wise observation. How keenly grateful people were to us, when we were able by stilling and calming them, to help them out of the entanglements of passion. Let us set cheerfully to work, she said, at what the men have left incomplete. We shall be preparing the most charming surprise for them when they return to us, and our temperate proceedings will have carried through and executed what their impatient natures would have spoilt. Speaking of temperance, my dear aunt, I cannot help saying how I am struck with the intemperance of men, particularly in respect of wine. It has often pained and distressed me when I observed how for hours together clearness of understanding, judgment, considerateness, and whatever is most amiable about them, will be utterly gone, and instead of the good which they might have done if they had been themselves, most disagreeable things sometimes threaten. How often may not wrong, rash determinations have arisen entirely from that one cause? Charlotte assented, but she did not go on with the subject. She saw only too clearly that it was Edward of whom Ottilie was thinking. It was not exactly habitual with him, but he allowed himself much more frequently than was at all desirable to stimulate his enjoyment and his power of talking and acting by such indulgence. If what Charlotte had just said had set Ottilie thinking again about men, and particularly about Edward, she was all the more struck and startled when her aunt began to speak of the impending marriage of the captain as of a thing quite settled and acknowledged. This gave a totally different aspect to affairs from what Edward had previously led her to entertain. It made her watch every expression of Charlotte's, every hint, every action, every step. Ottilie had become jealous, sharp-eyed, and suspicious, without knowing it. Meanwhile, Charlotte, with her clear glance, looked through the whole circumstances of their situation, and made arrangements which would provide, among other advantages, full employment for Ottilie. She contracted her household, not parsimoniously, but into narrower dimensions, and indeed, in one point of view, these moral aberrations might be taken for a not unfortunate accident. For in the style in which they had been going on, they had fallen imperceptibly into extravagance, and from a want of seasonable reflection, 
from the rate at which they had been living and from the variety of schemes into which they had been launching out their fine fortune which had been in excellent condition had been shaken if not seriously injured the improvements which were going on in the park she did not interfere with she rather sought to advance whatever might form a basis for future operations but here too she assigned herself a limit her husband on his return should still find abundance to amuse himself with in all this work she could not sufficiently value the assistance of the young architect in a short time the lake lay stretched out under her eyes its new shores turfed and planted with the most discriminating and excellent judgment the rough work at the new house was all finished everything which was necessary to protect it from the weather she took care to see provided and there for the present she allowed it to rest in a condition in which what remained to be done could hereafter be readily commenced again thus hour by hour she recovered her spirits and her cheerfulness ottilie only seemed to have done so she was only for ever watching in all that was said and done for symptoms which might show her whether edward would be soon returning and this one thought was the only one in which she felt any interest it was therefore a very welcome proposal to her when it was suggested that they should get together the boys of the peasants and employ them in keeping the park clean and neat edward had long entertained the idea a pleasant-looking sort of uniform was made for them which they were to put on in the evenings after they had been properly cleaned and washed the wardrobe was kept in the castle the more sensible and ready of the boys themselves were entrusted with the management of it the architect acting as chief director in a very short time the children acquired a kind of character it was found easy to mould them into what was desired and they went through their work not without a sort of manoeuvre as they marched along with their garden shears their long-handled pruning knives their rakes their little spades and hoes and sweeping brooms others following after these with baskets to carry off the stones and rubbish and others last of all trailing along the heavy iron roller it was a thoroughly pretty delightful procession the architect observed in it a beautiful series of situations and occupations to ornament the frieze of a garden house ottilie on the other hand could see nothing in it but a kind of parade to salute the master of the house on his near return and this stimulated her and made her wish to begin something of the sort herself they had before endeavoured to encourage the girls of the village in knitting and sewing and spinning and whatever else women could do and since what had been done for the improvement of the village itself there had been a perceptible advance in these descriptions of industry ottilie had given what assistance was in her power but she had given it at random as opportunity or inclination prompted her now she thought she would go to work more satisfactorily and methodically but a company is not to be formed out of a number of girls as easily as out of a number of boys she followed her good sense and without being exactly conscious of it her efforts were solely directed towards connecting every girl as closely as possible each with her own home her own parents brothers and sisters and she succeeded with many of them one lively little creature only was incessantly complained of as showing no capacity for work and as never likely to do anything if she were left at home ottilie could not be angry with the girl for to herself the little thing was especially attached she clung to her went after her and ran about with her whenever she was permitted and then she would be active and cheerful and never tire it appeared to be a necessity of the child's nature to hang about a beautiful mistress at first ottilie allowed her to be her companion then she herself began to feel a sort of affection for her and at last they never parted at all and nanny attended her mistress wherever she went the latter's footsteps were often bent towards the garden where she liked to watch the beautiful show of fruit it was just the end of the raspberry and cherry season the few remains of which were no little delight to nanny on the other trees there was a promise of a magnificent bearing for the autumn and the gardener talked of nothing but his master and how he wished that he might be at home to enjoy it ottilie could listen to the good old man for ever he thoroughly understood his business and edward 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 was for ever the theme of his praise ottilie observed how well all the grass which had been budded in the spring had taken i only wish the gardener answered my good master may come to enjoy them if he were here this autumn he would see what beautiful sorts there are in the old castle garden which the late lord his honoured father put there i think the fruit gardeners that are now don't succeed as well as the carthusians used to do we find many fine names in the catalogue and then we bud from them and bring up the shoots and at last when they come to bear it is not worth while to have such trees standing in our garden over and over again whenever the faithful old servant saw ottilie he asked when his master might be expected home and when ottilie had nothing to tell him he would look vexed and let her see in his manner that he thought she did not care to tell him 
the sense of uncertainty which was thus forced upon her became painful beyond measure and yet she could never be absent from these beds and borders what she and edward had sown and planted together were now in full flower requiring no further care from her except that nanny should be at hand with the watering-pot and who shall say with what sensation she watched the later flowers which were just beginning to show and which were to be in the bloom of their beauty on edward's birthday the holiday to which she had looked forward with such eagerness when these flowers were to have expressed her affection and her gratitude to him but the hopes which she had formed of that festival were dead now and doubt and anxiety never ceased to haunt the soul of the poor girl into real open hearty understanding with charlotte there was no more chance of her being able to return for indeed the position of these two ladies was very different if things could remain in their old state if it were possible that they could return again into the smooth even way of calm ordered life charlotte gained everything she gained happiness for the present and a happy future open before her on the other hand for ottilie all was lost one may say all for she had first found in edward what life and happiness meant and in her present position she felt an infinite and dreary chasm of which before she could have formed no conception a heart which seeks feels well that it wants something a heart which has lost feels that something is gone its yearning and its longing changes into uneasy impatience and a woman's spirit which is accustomed to waiting and to enduring must now pass out from its proper sphere become active and attempt and do something to make its own happiness ottilie had not given up edward how could she although charlotte wisely enough in spite of her conviction to the contrary assumed it as a thing of course and resolutely took it as decided that a quiet rational regard was possible between her husband and ottilie how often however did not ottilie remain at nights after bolting herself into her room on her knees before the open box gazing at the birthday presents of which as yet she had not touched a single thing not cut out or made up a single dress how often with the sunrise did the poor girl hurry out of the house in which she once had found all her happiness away into the free air into the country which then had had no charms for her even on the solid earth she could not bear to stay she would spring into the boat and row out into the middle of the lake and there drawing out some book of travels lie rocked by the motion of the waves reading and dreaming that she was far away where she would never fail to find her friend she remaining ever nearest to his heart and he to hers End of chapter seventeen